To start us off, we've got Sumit Amar from the Senior Director at Visa, who's going to give us a bit of a showdown between GraphQL and OData. Take it away, Sumit. Do you want to, first of all, put up your slides? All right. We've got some people here already saying, you know, GraphQL comes with a whole new dimension in itself and with its own ecosystem of tooling. So a lot of interest here. Okay, great. I'll leave you to it. Thanks, Sumit. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining this uh, this talk. Uh, I appreciate it. I know it's the evening time over there in Europe. And I'm saying hello from Austin, Texas, um, where I'm based out of. And um, this talk is going to talk about some of the API design and usability concerns, as well as we're going to compare the OData, Open Data Framework, with GraphQL for some of the data retrieval scenarios. So first disclaimer that my viewpoints, my ideas, design, whatever I'm talking about are my own not of my companies, so just to get that out of the way. And today's agenda is to talk about a little bit on restfulness. And if you already have um, you know, been building restful APIs, this will be just uh, you know, the common primer uh, refresher about that, uh, that aspect. And then also we're going to talk about the H2S. H2S is hypermedia as the engine of application state. Although it starts with hate, but there's a lot of love about it. I, I, I love about it, and I'm going to talk about that in detail with you as well. And then we'll talk about open data framework, O data for data retrieval, and how SQL-like queries can be represented in the query string itself so that you can simplify data retrieval for collections and instances of your entities. We're going to probably, if you have time, we're going to touch on webhooks or callbacks, but primarily we're going to compare the, uh, the O data calls with GraphQL calls as well. Um, I'm going to brush through this uh, quickly. Um, you know, you want to represent your resources or entities that are nouns, that are things, and they're not predicates or operations at all. And you want to depict your operations or uh, the actions using the HTTP verbs. And how is that possible? We're going to take a few examples. And we also want to talk about the entity relationships. If you come from the database background, you know, you have a, uh, a um, let's say, a video game player that, you know, wins some trophies or they play some games, you want to represent that in one query's result, you can do some joins in the back end. But how do you represent that in the APIs? We're going to take a look at some examples of uh, entity relationships as well. And then how the status codes of HTTP APIs is important. We're going to talk about that a little bit. And we're also going to touch the item potency um, in what cases we have to be extra cautious. Now, my preference is to use pluralized names uh, for the entities, but it's not really a, a rule or anything. You can use singular as well. It's totally fine. I use plural because you know you uh, come from a database, you know, uh, semantics where you know an entity that contains multiple records is is going to be plural. But it's not really any rule, so you're free to use either ways. However, you do want to semantically use the HTTP verbs to retrieve your action. And for example, you know, get users. I'm trying to get collection of users. And also, if I'm trying to get an instance of a user, then I'll have the URL appropriately built. And we're going to take an example here. Um, so you know, it's always easy to uh, divide your API um, signature based on whether you're trying to get a collection of entities or an instance or one object of the entity. And based on that, you can appropriately add your actions to that uh, uh, entity. Now. You already know get post, but I'm not going to uh, talk about these in detail. But the last two I'm going to talk a little bit about the patch. You already know that if you want to modify an entity using REST, you have to send the entire entity with modified fields and put it back using the put uh, HTTP method. But what if you had 30 fields and some of those representations of the entity are actually aggregation behind the scenes? So that means if I'm modifying an entity, I have to touch everything. Uh, maybe my system in the back end is smart that it doesn't touch anything if it hasn't changed. But still, there is still cognitive overload on the user that has to construct the whole entity and send it back to the server side. So how can we avoid that? So HTTP method patch enables you to do that. You can send only the parts of the data that you're changing, and then only that will be uh, modified. But there is an inherent problem in patch, which is of the item potency. Take an example where. Myself, I'm trying to modify the player entity. Let's say this player is my entity. I'm going to use that example in multiple uh, cases later on. Um, I modify two fields, let's say game and age. And the other uh, user of the API modified age and name. Now, separate fields, right? Only one field is common. But when I modify the entity, 
if I send the entire thing, it's item potent, meaning if I call it one time, 10 times, it doesn't matter. It will have the same effect of the last call that I have sent. But in case of patch, I could have a lost update problem. Now to handle the lost update problem, you know, there are multiple ways to do that. You can have the database driven, you know, last update time. You can, you know, uh, compare your update time with the last update time and see whether it is the right one. You could use um, if modified since, you know, clause in the HTTP header to match whether it was modified or not. You could also use e tags and see if match with the last e tag that you have sent, and then you know make sure that you can handle that. So you just have to uh, be a little bit careful using patch. Very useful, but it has a little bit of uh, um, uh, special handling to do. Now options just tells you all the issue methods exposed on a particular uh, entity. Of course, you know if I'm trying to do a patch on a on the user entity and it's not supported, I'm going to get to know about this the hard way anyways. But using options, you can just tell the user upfront, hey, look, you know for this entity you have these different methods available. Everything, all the methods that we've listed here are not available for all the entities. Now let's talk about the entity relationship real quick. And then after covering this topic, we're gonna to jump into the, the OData stuff and then you know, a little bit of HeyOS and then comparison with GraphQL. Um, here we're trying to retrieve the collection of players and I've just simply put three different fields. Um, sorry, I'm not, we're not trying to retrieve, we're trying to create a player object, which saying say post. Now collection is still players, this is the data that was sent, but note that response code is 201 created. It's not 200 okay, because we want to be descriptive about our HTTP codes. 201 is created and 202 is accepted. If it's a long running operation, you want to say, you know what, your request is accepted. We'll tell you when it's completed. But in this case, instantaneously, the user knows the entity got created and here is the result also of what was created. And the benefit of returning the entity that was just created is that the user can then use it to bind the data to their UI or do something else with it. Now let's take it a step further. And now I have got players slash 1A. 1A was the entity ID that was just created in the previous step, if you take a look at it over here. Now what we want to do is we want to add a trophy for this player that was just created. Player slash 1A gets us to the instance of this player. For that instance, we want to add a trophy. So that's why we're doing post on that trophies collection, couple of fields, and then you can see it is also created. And now I've got one T for that trophy that is also created. Now in order for me to, let's say I did that multiple times, and now I want to retrieve the details about this one particular player called players slash 1A. And now you can see that the collection of trophies is also sent along with, with this player's data. And so far, we have not talked about any usability problems. There are many here in this case. We've not talked about our data or graphical, no, no, that's just a basic REST operation. Quick uh, primer of, uh, you know, this uh, deck will be available. This is not a comprehensive list of all the status codes, but I just wanted to highlight one point that all the error code uh, status messages that start with 200 or are in 200s range are good things. There are things that you expected them to be and they have just behaved like that. Anything that starts with three is um, something that has happened just fine. And so you got what you were looking for, but the mechanics of that have been different. Like some resource was moved from one place to another, or it was from the cache. You know, you will uh, be notified based on the uh, based on the, re the request by the status code itself. Everything starts with four is or four hundred ranges. The user error, the user made a mistake. Again, debatable. I'm going to come to that and why it is. Uh, for example, you know, you. Um, have uh, too many requests coming in. That could be because you have a you know throttling of the user's API code. A key doesn't have the permission to call that many calls, so you return them 429. But it could also be that you couldn't handle that many calls, and then you return 429. Also, the conflict um, 409. Um, it could be because you handled the race condition in a very graceful way, but not so graceful for the users. They didn't know that they were having the conflict with another user sitting in a different part of the world. Uh, so anyways, I think that's, that's why I think that uh, 400 is, it could go either ways, but mostly it is the user error. Now, 500 errors are the ones that are bad ones. And the service is going down for under maintenance, 503 is happening, um, 501 obviously is not implemented. 500 internal server error should be renamed, I think, as 500, I have no idea what I'm talking about error, because that's the worst error that you return. Most of the cases, it's an exception that you couldn't handle and you return 500 by default. 
But another topic, it's a totally different topic. We can talk about the error codes in a whole new session uh, or so. We just, um, now the next topic is about item potency. I already touched upon that, so I'm gonna scan through it. Let's talk about HeyDevS a little bit. You know, when, um, when you see the API response from anywhere, let's say you are a designer, a de developer slash designer who's trying to build a user interface and you're consuming APIs, not really building APIs, but then you're given some API result sets by the developer that, hey, look, use these sample uh, outputs and bind your data. And then when I'm uh, done with my API implementation, you can actually integrate uh, in a with the real data set uh, from the APIs. So, but in that case, so the the person who is building the the UI wouldn't know how to you know reconstruct so the same data sets once the API is ready. And I'm going to talk about how that HeroS can help uh, this kind of person with. That's one use case where you want to get more information about the entity and how to construct more calls. The second is that you also want to be able to navigate from one state of the API ecosystem to another. So basically from the data model that you're given, how can you navigate around via the APIs and still have uh, no usability concerns? You have no concerns with the UI because you have everything visual and you can see that. Uh, but we're gonna take a look at how ADS will help us. Now, first simple example is that, just focus on the bottom part, which is data, ID name, country, game ID. If somebody was given this, um, how would you know that, how many total fields are in this, uh, um, this player object, is that it? Are there only just four fields? Um, and what's the data type for these fields? As well as how do I get to this game ID 1G? And do I have any way to navigate to that? So now if you look at the headers links on the top, you have uh, two uh, links here, each containing three sections. href is just the URL to get to this result set. So like player slash 1A will get you to this result set. So that means the diviner can then change 1A to 1B or whatever else and get another player's result as well. And similarly, you know, what all fields are there, what the data types are, you present it with the schemas link and dollar players just represents that, um, you know, that player entity can be seen here. And if you're using an old data framework, then this um, schema link automatically gets created for you, uh, but you also can obviously create it yourself and return it with your API calls. Um, now the key thing here we have added is the game slash one G as well. And here Ariel, for example, so first before I go to the games, Ariel is a relationship. The API call that you just made in this case was um, the slash player slash one A. So you know that you're trying to go to the player's entity. So the relationship of this data set is just players or it could also be called self, meaning whatever you just called. But now other entities that are embedded hidden inside this result set um, also need to be highlighted on what they are. In this case, we have a games entity, the games uh, schema is also given, the relationship is also given, and how to get to that is also given, okay? Now, jumping over to OData for retrieval, uh, open data framework, odata.org is where you have all the documentation, different libraries that are available. Um, the key idea is that you wanna be able to demonstrate SQL-like uh, syntax in the query string itself, in the URL itself, so that you can do you know, projections, you can do filtering, you can do pagination, um, you know, and you you want to basically do basic stuff that you do with SQL uh, for retrieval. Um, and we're also going to take a look at how this compares with the GraphQL system, which is more modern than old data. Uh, but again, you know, this I'm not going to, um, you know. Uh, suggest you use one or the other because both of them have advantages and their disadvantages as well. Um, the key, the benefit of ODATA is that I also think that you don't have to teach a developer a methodology to retrieve data. If they already have understood one syntax, they will, uh, for one entity, they'll also understand for the other entities. So that's the key thing. And again, you know, just to um, colloquially, you know, just highlight the equivalence of SQL queries with OData uh, keywords is this. And dollar is just mentioned in OData syntax to highlight that it is not a an arbitrary um, uh, URL argument. It is the one that belongs to OData framework so that the query string is passed accordingly by the, your server side. Um, and we can go through all of them one by one, but just to you know scan through it, select filter top, and then I've mentioned the, uh, the equivalent in, in SQL. Take a very simple example here. Then I have a player's entity. Assume that I have 30 fields in it. And when I say, hey, 
give me all the players back. It has 30 fields. I have, let's say, 3,000 records. I don't want to get all the records, first of all. I have to have some pagination scheme. But I also don't care about all the 30 fields. I'm only interested in the name of the player, or ID of the player, or something like that. So what you do is then just say players, and then dollar select is equal to name. But if you want more than name, you say name, comma, ID, et cetera. It will say comma ID and all the other fields that you want. You will put them in the select clause. Now here you will see the benefit of um, Hairos as well. That Hairos links now contain the precise URL that you requested. So that means you can replicate that. You can change that and make more calls, right? Um, and that's the result you have received. Because it's a collection, you have the data which is showing an array. And if it it were containing more results, then you would have more of these associative arrays created inside the data section. GraphQL equivalent, OK, really simple um, query. Then it has players. Players is the entity that we are interested in. But in this case, you can see it is plural. That means we're interested in the collection players. But we're only interested in the name attribute from it. And that is the beauty of uh, GraphQL that you'll see that I have got the data section back players as entity. First of all, now it mentions to me which entity I'm looking for. And the reason is that because I could request multiple entities through the same query. So now I got players, name AB. And you can see that it's so similar to what I requested. The response is so similar to what I requested. And, and you should just uh, keep in mind that it is not um, a JSON format that you're sending. It has its own syntax quirkiness, which I'm going to go into more details later. But you can see what you got is back exactly what you asked for. Take further examples where you want to put a filter clause. I want to filter the results that I'm looking for. I don't want 3,000 results. I just want the players whose name is AB. And you can see the filter is equal to name. And then obviously, you cannot use the equal to again. So the, the syntax is EQ, AB. And also, I want to say I only am interested in getting the ID and name. So I'm also providing a projection clause here. And you can see the same thing is replicated in the, uh, the link. And then I got ID and name. It's a collection because I was looking for multiple, all in this case. And also to fit in the PowerPoint screen, only one result is shown. GraphQL has two different ways to do this. Obviously, if you know that there was only going to be one record, then you go to the bottom side where you have a syntax where player, now not players, ID is 1A. And then you're able to get the ID and name. And this will be the result set, which will have data and then player. Now, again, it's not a collection. So it's just an instance. And hence, there is no square bracket, you know, a collection return to you. So again, if you didn't know there were multiple or one, you would just go by doing this exact replica of the O data query that I showed you earlier. Players is what I'm looking for. Filter is the keyword. And then I have in the filter object, I have name that I want to retrieve. But what? operator I want to use for name. It could be EQ, it could be in, it could be um, um, uh, less than. It, it, depending on the data type, you will have a, the uh, the options available in this particular associative array key. And because I'm interested only in the name equal to AB, I'll get this result set, which is very similar to the previous one. And again, I'm only interested in ID and name, so my result set is already filtered for that. OK, now. Um, I want to do page pagination. Uh, so I want to, you know, basically in database, I can get top few records and I can start from a certain number of uh, records by skipping some records, right? Using offset. Um, again, very simply, top one, offset two, skip two records and then retrieve one record. We want to do the same thing in our data, uh, in, in uh, GraphQL. You can see the quirky syntax here, first one, there's no comma or anything, it's a syntax, offset two. And again, these are the fields I'm looking for. And your result, your result and figure is just this. Very similar, but different way of doing the same thing. Again, the benefit is that whatever you really you're uh, showing here in request is going to be added in the response. So it's very predictable as well. Now, expanding. What expanding means is that um, let's say we have a list of uh, 15,000 players, and they play one game. They are associated with one game only. And all of them have a game ID. And game entity itself has, let's say, 10 fields. You don't want to retrieve all the players and expand and have an entity embedded inside, kind of like in MongoDB, that all the entities are sub entities are embedded inside the, the document or the result or the, the record. Um, we just have the ID. But we want to expand that and get more details about it. 
And I don't want to get the result expanded for everything, but just for one particular player. In this case, player with an ID 1A, OK? Um, and then what do I do? Um, sorry about that. Um, I just say player 1A, dollar expand is game. And then what happens is the game entity now is expanded. Earlier, it was just game ID uh, 1G, OK? Now, with uh, GraphQL, this is, I think, where the real beauty of GraphQL comes into picture, that I don't have to do any mumbo jumbo about expand or anything like that. I just have to say, look, my player entity has these fields, but because game is an ag aggregated entity, I also want that game. I also want its ID and name. And similarly, now you can see the result set is exactly the same how you requested uh, earlier. Now, ordering. Simply order by is equal to name. You can have name comma some other field, and you can have name comma or space DESC or ASC, um, and then your results will be sorted. Similarly, in um, GraphQL, a little bit of weird syntax, but you know we get used to it when we start using it. Order by again in the again you see earlier when we didn't use any expression here, it was no parentheses. Let's take a reference check here. Um, example of uh, see here players, but there's nothing here, right? Every time you add something like filter or ID or you know other keywords, you have to um, put the parentheses around it. So in this case, parentheses is fine, order by is fine, but then in the order by which is an object now, you have to have the 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 field that you're looking for and what sort of sorting you want on it. So like ASC is ascending and DESC will be descending. Um, so that's something that you have to kind of get used to a little bit. But now I want to talk about a special case um, of running a method in the URL and then retrieving something. Um, you know, in, in if you're a Java developer, C-sharp developer, you're familiar with Lambda expressions based on Lambda calculus you, know, you did in school. So in this example, what we're trying to do is we're trying to retrieve all the players who live in Foster City and they have valid trophies. Okay, that is our kind of expression. And this first example shows you how to do this in C sharp. And, um, and now the second is you know how to do this in O data, where slash players, again, filter clause, player slash any. And then again, this predicator is gonna be P. P's address city is Foster P just means an instance of one player in the collection. And then also I wanted to say P dot validate trophies. So this is mentioned in the URL, but it actually gets executed on the entities method, which I think is pretty beautiful when you look at, uh, you know, not just just a dumb retrieval, but also is, is more conditional retrieval based on a method execution. We can skip that. We don't have uh, uh, that time, but you know, in summary, um, we talked about a little bit of RESTful standards O data and how the O data compares with GraphQL, and uh, I'm open to questions uh, if you may have. Spot on timing, but um, uh, so that was fantastic. Uh, for, for that uh, for the presentation but my only issue is I had a call that I was just finishing up so I missed who won the who won the smackdown <laughs> I, I I I'm gonna shy away from you know picking one winner. Uh, you, you're <laughs> gonna do that <laughs> you, have you, you have the disclaimer you've got the disclaimer you've said this isn't the views <laughs> of me so if you were starting uh, so under what, when would you use, when would you definitely choose GraphQL? I think like um, the use case, yeah. The use case, you know, so let me tell you a little bit of a limitation of a gra uh, OData first. OData works really well when you have a, a relational database, which can show relationships and which can also show um, the, the joining, the expansion. But when you use OData in a, in a document database like MongoDB, the, there are some limitations that you will have to manually implement in your OData uh, framework. So I think I feel that uh, there, are, uh, there are complexities also of obviously building an OData driver versus building a GraphQL driver. 
Uh, one thing that people might think that, gosh, you know, ODATA is only for retrieval, but in GraphQL, you could also do mutation, which is changing the object. But in fact, you could do both in, in both cases. Yeah. Um, not very close, but, you know, if you um, don't want to put that uh, burden on the, the API user to uh, uh, to construct these, you know, the results set like looking GraphQL queries and just deal with the, the query string itself, then maybe ODATA is better. But if you want to have most predictability that get back whatever you really exactly requested for in that graphical query, then graphical is better for them. And I think I think both of them have advantages and I like both the frameworks actually, but I just wanted to showcase in a forum where how they look like with each other compared. That, that's a really good point. Um, the So it's almost like with GraphQL, I mean, I know it's interactive and there's ways to figure out what the data model is, but you know, need to know exactly what you're asking for at the end of the day in the GraphQL. Exactly. I think that that, is, that could be a benefit. That could also be like you have to learn the data structure before you ask for anything. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, okay, cool. Someone, uh, Andrew Soden, who's been part of a lot of the technical tracks yesterday and today. Um, thanks a lot, Andrew, for participating so much. He's actually said that this is one of probably one of his favorite sessions. So congratulate. And, that, and that's someone who I know from the way he's been interacting over the last two days. He's been well, he's been watching them all. So I mean, that's high praise. Um, the and another comment from Patrick. He says GraphQL is excellent for mobile UI, UIs with great tooling and integration with front end web frameworks such as React. Would you agree with that, or is there, or do you want to add to that sort of comment? Um, no, I think I think it's a, it's a good comment actually because um, the folks that are building uh, the uh, the mobile applications they're really uh, generally working with sample data sets that they're binding in their uh, apps. And now with GraphQL, which looks, the, the input looks so similar to what output is gonna be. So it makes their life much simpler. And uh, I think, um, I haven't used it with the React particularly, but I've, I can definitely empathize with the mobile developers, uh, the comment. But yeah. I don't know, I, yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a good way to think about it. Yeah, there's some great tooling from like Apollo Studio, for example. Um, that it combines GraphQL and some uh, React um, mm -hmm. tools. Finally, one last question. Is, does GraphQL work with RDBMS or NoSQL uh, databases? Oh, GraphQL can work with, uh, with any. Uh, there is no problem with using on RDBMS or NoSQL-based systems. The key thing about GraphQL is that it's not um, tied with any, um, any downstream system. You almost always have to either write a GraphQL um, engine in the middle, or you have to rely on one that is out there in the market. And most of the languages now have the GraphQL um, um, libraries available. But yes, it, it, that, that's another beauty part of it. It's it's um, more forgiving when you use it with any kind of database versus OData, which is more, I would say, you know, leans towards the RDBMS sort of a, a querying system. Because as you can see that all the keywords that I showed for OData were almost taken from that TSQL uh, book or SQL inside book, let's say. Right, okay, cool. Yeah, then maybe that's where that question's come from. Okay, that's a fantastic presentation. Like I say, people have been calling out. So if you get a chance, maybe um, introduce yourself into in the chat to some mm -hmm. of the people on that stage. Oh, one last one from Dennis. What about time series data, which tends to be common in financial applications, uh, which framework would be best suited? Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it could be either or, uh, really, um, because both of them let you filter data at the server side. Uh, both let you, you know, have security baked into it without any sensitive information passing around from the request standpoint. And also for protecting your API calls, you will still, you know, if you're you know, managing to send across the PAN numbers or the sensitive information, then you will need to have mutual TLS implemented, regardless of whether using GraphQL or um, or uh, O database, REST based O data. So I think it should be, it could be, both could be used actually, in my, in my opinion. Okay, cool. Do you know of any um, financial entities that are using GraphQL in production or in real use case environments? I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, um, I cannot comment on that because, you know, that um, um, uh, we, I'm sure we could find some use uh, uh, case studies, but, but I don't know uh, any on top of my head. 
Yeah, I know. I've, I'm, uh, my apologies. I'm a little bit out of touch um, to the uh, to the re, uh, the viewer Christian who's asked about that. There is mm -hmm. GraphQL.org. They've got a section uh, called Community that used to actually have, I think, under Foundation actually. So the Foundation mm -hmm. um, has a list of the members. So mm -hmm. Foundation.GraphQL.org. I'm just bringing up the members now. Um, and so mm -hmm. PayPal is a member. Um, okay. Shopify is a member. So mm -hmm. some of those ones. OK, I'm going to check that out as well myself. But I just didn't know. Sorry about that, that I didn't have the context about. But I'm I know. I, this yeah, fair, fair enough. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's also it's tricky because um, uh, the uh, because as you said at your front of the um, talk, you know, these are your views not mm -hmm. necessarily visas views so you know the, yeah. for this talk you can't really represent visa on the use of that graphql or not you know but i'm okay. sure it's one of the many technologies you're looking at um the so yes yeah, so i have a look at those as far as seeing who else is out there in the in the community okay thanks very much to uh, really wonderful to uh, chat with you and fantastic way to finish today thanks very much thank you for the insightful questions i appreciate it thanks a lot and okay. have a good evening Thanks, Sumit. Um, 